Hi, welcome back to St. Thomas Aquinas for everyone. I'm Dave Palmer, and we are completing now in this video our final lesson on St. Thomas Aquinas on the law. And as you'll recall, we had kind of a general introduction to the law, and then we talked about the four kinds of law, which are the eternal, the divine, the natural, and the human, and then some particular applications of the law. And now we're going to wrap up with a look at how Thomas treats the old law and the new law, meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament when it comes to sacred scripture, and we'll see what he has to say about that. Uh, I find this one kind of funny because in question 98, article one, he says whether the old law was good. Now you probably know where Thomas is going to go with this because of course uh, he's a big fan of sacred scripture and so it seems hard to believe that he's going to say the old law was not good and of course he's not going to when we think of the old law we think of the ten commandments but it's a lot more than that there's ceremonial laws and judicial laws and moral laws but the ten commandments is what we think of most and so thomas says very emphatically without any doubt the old law was good for just as a doctrine is shown to be good by the fact that it accords with right reason so is a law proved to be good if it accords with reason. Now the old law was in accordance with reason because it repressed concupiscence, which is in conflict with reason as evidenced by the commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Okay, one thing that's going to keep coming out as we compare old law to new law in this lesson is that the old law kind of had to do with the temporal uh, order, whereas the new law really directs us towards the eternal order or the supernatural order okay and so keep that in mind uh, moreover the same law forbids all kinds of sin and these two are contrary to reason consequently it is evident that it was a good law and the apostle argues in the same way remember when he talks about the apostle he's talking about saint paul i am delighted he says with the law of god according to the inward man and again he says i consent to the law that is good okay but, okay, here's the big but, it must be noted that the good has various degrees, as Dionysius states. Uh, and by the way, Dionysius uh, the Areopagite is one of the early Christian uh, theologians that Thomas quotes a lot. Of course, the one he quotes probably the most, well, the most he, he quotes the sacred scripture, and then probably Aristotle and Augustine, but... Dionysius is right up there as far as uh, who he quotes. Peter Lombard, the commentator, he quotes quite a few times as well, or, or mentions. Okay, um, in things ordained to the end, there is perfect goodness when a thing is such that it is sufficient in itself to conduce to the end, while there is imperfect goodness when a thing is in some assistance in attaining the end, but is not sufficient for the realization thereof. Okay, so making a distinction here between the old law and the new law. All right, this is interesting. I remember that when I first learned this, it just blew me away that the old law was given through angels. Isn't that interesting? That of all the ways that God could have passed along the old law, he chose to do it through angels. And here's an image of, um, I think that's what Balaam's you know, donkey or something and an angel appearing. And of course, we have a lot of instances in of the Old Testament in particular, but New Testament also where angels uh, intervened. Thomas says it was fitting that the perfect law of the New Testament should be given by the incarnate God immediately, Jesus, right? But that the old law should be given to men by the ministers of God, the angels. It is thus that the apostle Paul, at the beginning of his epistle to the Hebrews, proves the excellence of the new law over the old, because in the New Testament, Quote, God hath spoken to us by his son, whereas in the Old Testament, the word was spoken by angels. Isn't that interesting that the Old, the, the Old Testament was passed down through angels? All right, so uh, very interesting. Whether the new law fulfills the old law. You may be familiar with something called typology, where Old Testament figures like David or Solomon or Moses were types of the new types of Jesus. Okay, so we see that there is a relationship between the two, but that the new law fulfills the old law. All right, so when Jesus preached on, you know, the, the, the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount or when the, the institution of the Eucharist or the Holy Priesthood or certainly culminating in the death, 
and resurrection of Christ. Okay, these are all new law. These are all, you know, New Testament uh, things, right? He says the new law is compared to the old law as the perfect to the imperfect. Again, here's that comparison again. Temporal, supernatural, what's down here to what our final end is. Now, everything perfect fulfills that which is lacking in the imperfect. And accordingly, the new law fulfills the all old by supplying that which was lacking in the old law. The end of the old law was the justification of men. The law, however, could not accomplish this, but foreshadowed it by a certain ceremonial actions and promised it in words. Okay, so Thomas is saying here that what the old law wanted to do, it couldn't do, it couldn't accomplish it because it needed God to take on human form in order to accomplish the end of the old law. And in this respect, the new law fulfills the old law by justifying men through the power of Christ's passion. All right, so Christ was necessary. And we're going to get into that as we get later into the third part of the Summa. Why did Jesus have to be born? Why did he have to suffer and die? Whether the new law should have been given from the beginning of the world. Now, isn't this interesting? Like, why do we have to wait? Why, why did we have to wait until Jesus was born and suffered and died before the new law was kind of ordained or, or given to us. And Thomas has three reasons. He says, three reasons may be assigned why it was not fitting for the new law to be given from the beginning of the world. The first is because the new law consists chiefly in the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is behooved not to be given abundantly until sin, which is the obstacle of grace, had been cast out of man through the accomplishment of his redemption by Christ. Okay, so Christ had to live. Christ had to usher in the reign <clears throat> of grace in order to really bring the new law to us. And so sin had to kind of exist, you know, in men for a while to, to really necessitate, you know, to, to bring the, the need of Christ, right? The second reason may be taken from the perfection of the new law, because the thing is not brought to perfection at once from the outset, but through an orderly succession of time. Thus, one is at first a boy and then a man, and this reason is stated by the Apostle Paul. The law was our pedagogue in Christ that we might be justified by faith, but after the faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogue. And so God had a plan, and it took time, okay, and it wasn't to be done instantaneously, kind of like our lives, where we, we have rational, discursive minds, where we learn things slowly, whereas an angel was judged at the moment of its creation. Remember we learned that? <clears throat> because of the difference in nature, all right? The third reason is found in the fact that the new law is the law of grace, wherefore it behooved man, first of all, to be left to himself under the state of the old law, so that through falling into sin, he might realize his weakness and acknowledge his need of grace, okay? It's like we don't realize we need something until uh, you, you know, we, we fall in, into the need for it. You know, you wouldn't, kind of a dumb example perhaps, but uh, you wouldn't need food unless you felt hunger. You wouldn't need sleep until you you felt tired, right? So we had to feel the need for uh, Jesus and for, you know, what, what Jesus was going to offer us. Whether certain definite counsels are fittingly proposed in the new law. This is the last article we're going to talk about in this one. Okay, so what are the, the councils, the evangelical councils? Poverty, chastity, and obedience help us live the gospel more fully and typically embraced by those in religious life. These are unique to the new law. Okay, they weren't really common in the old law. This is a new law kind of thing, and well, what are they all about? The difference between a council and a commandment is that a commandment implies obligation, whereas a council is left to the option of the one who it is given. Okay. Consequently, in the new law, which is the law of liberty, counsels are added to the commandments and not in the old law, which is the law of bondage. We must therefore understand, uh, understand the commandments of the new law to have been given about matters that are necessary to gain the end of eternal bliss. Okay, very important. To which end the new law brings us forthwith, but that the counsels are about matters that render the gaining of this end more assured and expeditiously. All right, one more slide, and this last slide is going to have a lot of information, but it's really, really important. And this kind of summarizes everything we've been talking about so far in the Summa. Man is placed between the things of this world 
and the spiritual goods wherein eternal happiness consists so that the more so that the more he cleaves to the one the more he withdraws from the other and conversely wherefore he that cleaves wholly to the things of this world so as to make them his end and to look upon them as the reason and rule of all he does falls away altogether from spiritual goods hence this disorder is removed by the commandments okay so the commandments try to pull us away from concupiscence nevertheless for man to gain the end aforesaid he does not need to renounce the things of the world altogether since he can while using the things of this world attain to eternal happiness provided he does not place his end in them but he will attain more speedily thereto by giving up the goods of the world entirely wherefore the evangelical counsels are given for this purpose okay so think of the things that we enjoy in this world banana splits and dogs and even our our children a lot a lot of good things all right nothing wrong with these in fact they are as we've learned there's something that we can come to know about god through these but we have to be able to detach from these temporal goods in order to attach to the eternal good the evangelical councils voluntarily allow us to do this and that shows our love for god and this is in the law of grace which is the law of the new testament okay that wraps up our lessons on law i hope you've enjoyed them we're going to be going into in the next series of lessons merit justification grace okay very very important and so i'll uh, stick with us and uh we'll have another video out soon Thanks for uh, watching and sharing and liking and subscribing, and I hope you're enjoying these. God bless you. This is St. Thomas Aquinas for everyone. I'm Dave Palmer.